1630, uh, John Winthrop, who was governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, ran into a friend who was very distraught, and he said, uh, oh, I don't know what happened. My wife went insane suddenly. I don't, I don't know what caused this. And John Winthrop pulls himself up and he says, I can tell you why she went insane. She tried to read a book. And this pretty much encapsulates much of the colonial era's official attitude about women's capabilities and therefore about women's place in society. Uh, the general idea was uh, that God, nature, and um, law and custom uh, preordained the place for women in society, which was subordinate to men and, in fact, under men's control. Uh, what Winthrop was getting at was their version, if you will, of nature or science, which was that women had very small, weak brains, and those brains were not capable of rational thought. In the 17th and 18th century, rational thought meant moral, what we would call today moral thought, knowing right from wrong. So that it, in law, women, children, and idiots were viewed as non compass mentis, not mentally capable. Uh, and that was what Winthrop was suggesting, that for a woman to try to read a book was beyond her physical f capabilities, uh, her mental capabilities. Uh, it was also believed that God had created woman uh, to be man's helpmeet, they called, we would say helpmate, and that it was, of course, Eve's fault that all manner of human disasters were brought upon the world. Uh, the general idea was that women, without a man to guide and control her, a woman would create chaos and destruction in the world. Uh, English people were not the only people with that mythology. We know about Pandora. Pandora is responsible for letting loose on the world uh, death and disease and, and all manner of evil. So that women's job in life, that is women's destiny given to them by God, was to be helpful to a man. Uh, her capabilities meant that she had to be controlled by that man, uh, had to be regulated because she didn't understand right from wrong. And then, of course, laws and customs grew up around these notions, or built on these notions, that guaranteed that women could never be, in fact, autonomous and could never uh, be on their own. It was assumed that the mark of adulthood for a woman, the only mark of adulthood for a woman, was marriage and motherhood. Men could, had all kinds of markers in their lives. Uh, they could join the militia. Uh, they could be an elder in the church. They could get married. They could serve uh, uh, in political office. There were a whole series of things that marked adulthood for a man. But the only thing that marked adulthood for a woman was marriage and motherhood. And so the pressures on women were enormous. Uh, also, as there was virtually little a woman could do on her own to earn money, marriage was the reasonable way to make sure you had a roof over your head. Uh, women who didn't marry were seen uh, and criticized openly as undesirable in some fashion. In New England, if you weren't married by the time you were 30, you were called a thorn back. That issue was so prickly that no man would have you. Uh, so generally speaking, the assumption was that a woman's destiny was to marry, to be a mother, and to be obedient and submissive to the wishes of her husband. The law made sure this was true because when you married, you became in law, femme covert, that is a woman covered. And that meant that you couldn't sue or be sued. Uh, 
you couldn't own, inherit, or will property. You couldn't um, uh, testify in court. Uh, everything you own that you brought into the marriage belonged to your husband, including your personal wardrobe, and your body belonged to your husband. So that you lost legal identity on the whole once you got married. If you were a thornback or if you were uh, a widow or if you were not married, you were femme soul, woman alone. Notice the implication there. Oh, how sad, you're a woman alone. Uh, and then you had uh, these kinds of legal rights because otherwise you would be a dependent upon the community. So women's destiny, if you will, was to uh, serve the needs of her husband in every fashion. Uh, students of mine all assume that women have always been responsible for raising their children. But this, of course, is not true. Women were responsible for nursing their babies and producing their children, and they were responsible in colonial America for teaching their daughters household activities that they would engage in as a wife and mother. That is, teaching them how to uh, mend clothes, spin in the 17th century, how to churn butter, how to do all those household production activities that women were expected to do, turning the raw materials of the farm into usable items. You know, you can't eat a piece of wheat. You have to know how to make bread. Uh, they, they taught their daughters what we would call vocational training, but the moral upbringing of your child, the socialization of your child, was the father's responsibility because he could tell right from wrong, whereas his wife could not. It's not until after the American Revolution that it is decided that women can raise their children in the way we think of raising children, uh, that is teaching them how to behave in the world. So how did it come about that this position uh, is abandoned? Two things contribute to the remarkably radical idea after the American Revolution that women could think after all. Uh, and that women could raise their own children. One is the Enlightenment. That is, by the 1720s and 40s, even before the American Revolution, new ideas about the capacity to be rational, uh, being an attribute of all human beings, came, came into uh, play. That is the notion that not just men, but all people are capable of rational thought if they are educated. That is, if they are themselves uh, uh, properly taught to develop that capacity. But the second thing is that in the American Revolution, women had proven over and over again in every possible way that they were capable of choosing liberty over tyranny. They were capable of choosing independence over dependence. They had participated at every phase of what we call the revolutionary era. They had boycotted British goods. They had written propaganda for uh, the American side. They had uh, uh, signed documents saying that they were supporters of the American resistance to British tyranny. They had uh, helped the army in the army camps. They had gotten wounded uh, while uh, uh, standing at the cannons if their husbands fell, uh, fell in warfare. Some of them had even uh, disguised themselves as men and fought in the American Revolution. They had kept the farms going uh, when their husbands went away. They had proven throughout these long two decades, really, of the struggle for independence, they had proven that they could pick uh, liberty, that they had been able to make moral decisions. And so when the war was over, 
for women's historians, the question becomes, so how were women rewarded? Well, they didn't get a political voice. Uh, the people who uh, had the power to make those decisions were not ready to let women vote, let alone hold office. They were not ready to change the laws that made women permanently dependent on their husbands. Uh, many books quote the famous letter from Abigail Adams to John Adams where she says, remember the ladies. She's not talking about giving women political rights. She's talking about giving women legal rights. That is, allowing women, once they got married, to retain some kind of control over the property they brought into the marriage. So if your husband is a drunkard or if your husband is a bad businessman and he, he wastes the property that you've brought into the marriage, you don't wind up a pauper. And John Adams' reply to that, by the way, was ha, ha, ha. If you read that exchange of letters, it's four letters between Abigail and John that people often talk about them as having an egalitarian marriage. Well, here's what these letters basically say. John, remember the ladies. Abigail, ha, ha, ha. John, I'm serious. Abigail, shut up. And he says, I don't want to hear any more about this. Be quiet. Uh, so maybe not such an equal marriage after all. Uh, Women didn't get those kinds of legal rights. That is, married women didn't get those kind of legal rights. In fact, it's not until 1848 in New York that they pass a Married Women's Property Act. And for reasons that still sort of amaze me, and I'd like to do research on it, actually Mississippi passes a Married Women's Property Act before New York does. Uh, but other states don't until much later in the 19th century. So they're not going to get legal rights. They're not going to get political rights after the revolution. That is as an acknowledgement of their participation in winning American independence. But they do get this. They get an acknowledgement that they are capable of moral and rational decision making. And this is an enormous step forward for women. I mean, we can say, ah, oh, that isn't really very much. But in fact, it is a lot because it also leads to a shift in who is going to be responsible for educating children. And that shift gives women an enhanced status, even if it doesn't give them um, uh, uh, rights or, or political rights, legal rights or political rights. The revolutionary generation believed that the survival of the republic depended upon the next generation being patriotic. That is, the next generation had to be willing, as the first generation was, to fight and die and give up everything they had to defend American liberty. Well, how did you get them to do that? You had to said men like Benjamin Rush, you had to raise up patriotic sons. You had to educate patriotic sons. And they decided that the person to do this was the mother. Women had had nothing to do with the raising of sons until that moment. Uh, sons were going to be, in effect, the real citizens of the country, and their fathers were going to be the ones who, who played a role in their education. Now mothers were being urged to take on the responsibility of educating their sons. You've got to raise patriotic sons and daughters. The entire survival of our country depends on you. So women were given what historians have called a civic role, not a political role, but a civic role. They were the glue that were going to hold together the revolutionary generation and the next generation's uh, defense of the republic. Well, women accepted this role. Um, but they, 
they took hold of this new ideology, which came to be known as Republican motherhood. Not Republican as the modern Republican Party, but Republican as in we have created a republic. So they took on Republican motherhood as their duty and their obligation to their country, which is why it's a civic role. You're doing it for your country. Uh, but they said, well, gee, if we're supposed to educate our sons and explain to them the value of liberty and the rights that they're entitled to and teach them about the American Revolution, we've got to be educated. We've got to study history. If we're going to cite for them the Roman Republic, we've got to know something about the Roman Republic. If we're going to teach them about Locke's social contract, we've got to study political philosophy, and we've got to study geography, and we've got to be educated. And in that way, they've left their mark on this ideology that modern-day women would say was, you know, not very liberating. You were still in the home. You were still responsible for the home. You still didn't have any political rights. You just had the civic responsibility. Well, there were women who took hold of this uh, responsibility and said, turned it into a demand for education. And one of the most radical results of the American Revolution is the rise of female education. In Every single one of the new states, that is the colonies turned states, young ladies' academies arose. And not, not poor women and not farmers' wives, but the American middle and upper class, the young women of those classes, got a formal education for the first time in American history. After 200 years, women went to school. And uh, as I'm often fond of saying, uh, school administrators were just as lazy then as they are now. And so instead of creating a new curriculum for these women's academies, they just took the curriculum that boys got in their preparatory academies for college and they gave it to the women, to the young women. And so in places like the Young Ladies Academy of Philadelphia, women were studying science and mathematics and uh, a, a political philosophy and philosophy and history and ancient history. And they were getting a first class education for the first time. And they were doing it away from their homes in the company of other women. Anyone who has ever gone, gone to college knows that the most important part often of that education is the conversations you have with your peers. Education is radicalizing. And though it seems like a long time between the end of the war and the rise of the academies and Seneca Falls in 1848, when women demanded equal rights with men, it really was only about 70 years. And so you can see the impact of this new ideology, Republican motherhood, in the rise of education for women, in then producing women who said, that's not enough. We want equal opportunity. We want voting rights. We want economic opportunity. We want a change in the laws. And we want to be acknowledged as men's equals. So this shift in ideology after the war is enormously important in trying to understand how we get to the women's movement of the 19th century. I'm often amused at thinking about the men we call the Founding Fathers rolling over in their graves when they realized that Republican motherhood uh, led the way to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the women who led the women's movement of the 19th century.